Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this special dean's lecture. It's great to see you all here, and I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic hour together. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Richard Besser to the school. Um, we are delighted he accepted our invitation to visit us. He's been here a good part of the day, and um, uh, we appreciate the time he's been give, has been able to give us, and and very much uh, looking forward to his uh, dean's lecture. Um, Richard Besser is president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, a position that he assumed back in April of 2017. As I think most of uh, all of you in this room uh, know, that is the th that the foundation is the country's largest private foundation devoted solely to improving the nation's health. And I will add, we have been, um, the foundation has been very generous uh, to uh, those of us at the school, um, at the School of Medicine, throughout the university. Uh, the foundation has uh, supported many projects um, and programs of our, our faculty, um, and we appreciate that. As I was preparing my remarks today, I remembered that the first grant that I was PI on came from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Yes. <laughs> And it's, it, was a, it was a study that was, a, it was an observational study, a descriptive study, looking at the functional outcomes and quality of life of people who had uh, sustained a very serious injury. And those of you who know the work I have done over the years, that truly launched my career. Um, most of my time has been spent looking at the, con the long-term consequences, physical and uh, mental consequences of um, injuries and what we can do to improve those consequences. And, um, and that first grant made all the difference. So I know you had nothing to do with that at the time, <laughs> but thank you to the foundation. Um, and that's just one example of the um, of the impact that the foundation has had um, on our faculty and our school, and we appreciate that. So prior to um, starting his position at the foundation, Dr. Besser had already made major contributions in the field of public health, and he did so in several different ways. Um, he started his career at CDC in 1991 as a member of the Epidemic Intelligence Service working on the epidemiology of foodborne illness. He then decided to try his hand at academia and went to um, the University of California at San Diego and spent five years there in a pedi as pediatric residency director while also conducting research and working for the county health department um, on the control of pediatric uh, tuberculosis. He then decided to return to the CDC in 1998 as an infectious disease epidemiologist working on pneumonia, antibiotic resistance, and the control of antibiotic overuse. During his tenure at CDC, Dr. Besser took on broader and broader responsibilities, um, including uh, the director of the Coordinating Center for Terrorism Preparedness and Emergency Response, where I actually first met uh, Dr. Besser um, as I was a member of that office's um, board of scientific counselors. Uh, Dr. Besser was responsible in that uh, capacity for all of CDC's public health uh, emergency preparedness and emergency response activities. Then in uh, January of 2009, he was tapped uh, to be, uh, become the acting director of this uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, during which time he led the CDC's effort and response to the H1N1 influenza pandemic. Then later in 2009, as many of you know, Dr. Besser left the CDC uh, to begin his third career in public health and joined ABC News as its chief health and medical editor, where he provided medical analysis and um, reports for all of ABC's uh, news programs um, and platforms. His weekly uh, health uh, chats on social media reached millions um, uh, of people around the world. The author and co-author of hundreds of publications, abstracts, chapters, editorials, and publications, Dr. Besser has earned many awards for his work in public health, including the Surgeon General's uh, medallion for his leadership during the H1N1 response. And in 2011, uh, then Dean Michael Clagg uh, awarded him uh, the Dean's Medal here at the School of Public Health uh, for his contributions in public health. His investigative reporting into umbilical cord uh, blood banking was nominated for an Emmy Award in 2011, and in 2012, he received an overseas, the Overseas uh, Press Club Award as part of ABC's coverage of global uh, maternal health issues and two Peabody Awards as part of uh, ABC uh, News coverage of Hurricane Sandy and Robin uh, Roberts' health uh, journey. 
His book, entitled Tell Me the Truth, Doctor, Easy to Understand, Answers to the Most Confusing and Critical Health Questions, uh, was published in 2013. Dr. Besser received his Bachelor of Arts degree in economics from Williams College in 1981 and his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. But most importantly, he came to Johns Hopkins and completed his residency and chief res residency in pediatrics um, here at the School of Medicine, um, where I just recently learned he was an intern of our beloved um, Matu Santosham. So well trained indeed. <laughs> uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Besser. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dean, Dean McKenzie. It's, it's, tr it's truly an honor to, to be here today. Um, as, as the Dean said, I have a long history with, uh, with Hopkins it's, uh, and, and a great affection for, for the institution. Um, when I was looking at where I wanted to do my pediatric training, uh, I was uh, immediately drawn to Hopkins. And it was because of the School of Public Health. Uh, there were a lot of great places to train in pediatrics, but I had a real interest in, in public health and global health, and uh, so I was, uh, I was thrilled when, I, when I, uh, I, I matched here. And it was, I think, on my one of my first rotations in the hospital uh, that Matu Santosham was, was my attending. And, um, and we got talking, and, and uh, I learned more about what he was doing. And so I, I, uh, I got a visa, and I, uh, I crossed Wolf Street to the School of Public Health. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, knocked on his door and said, you know, when I finish my, my pediatric training, uh, I would love to work for you. And uh, uh, that started a, a, a relationship that's gone on for more than 30 years uh, with Matu as my mentor, and uh, I thank you very much. Uh, and when I finished my, my training, he gave me my first job. Uh, uh, he he uh, hired me to go to, uh, to Bangladesh, to the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, uh, to work on a study. Um, and I learned a lot through that experience. I learned that working in Bangladesh, you can get dengue fever. Um, and I learned uh, that you sometimes learn the most from those research projects, projects that turn out the worst. And uh, so while the study itself um, was not a huge success. Uh, what I learned through the process uh, was really, to me, uh, so eye-opening and ignited my passion for public health. And, uh, and also get, kind of gave me this sense that, um, that I didn't need to be constrained in terms of thinking about how to approach public health, that there are all kinds of ways to to, to go at it. Here, uh, there's a professor at Hopkins who has enough confidence to send me around the world to work on this project, and it was just terrific. It was terrific to have that sense that someone had confidence in me and to, to try and, and, and make it happen and have, have the bandwidth to, to fail. You know, and that's something we don't often talk about. You know, we have, we have people who, who train under us, but are we always giving them not just the, the tools to succeed, but also the, the acceptance uh, uh, that, that it may fail and that that's part of the, the, the process that we're, the, that we're going through. Um, so uh, as, as the dean mentioned, I'm so glad we launched your career uh, at the foundation. It, 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 uh, it, uh, it, it predates me, but uh, it's wonderful. I'll use that in my talks now. Um, but as, as the dean mentioned, I, I um, I've taken in my career a view that, that you can practice public health through, through many different ways, many different, different lenses. And that's been one of the really exciting things for me is, is with each of these, these uh, careers, looking at, well, you know, what, what can this contribute to public health? So the, the five years I spent in academia studying cross-border transmission of tuberculosis. Uh, it was really exciting to try and look at what's the root cause of the high rates of pediatric TB in, in San Diego. Uh, and we found that, uh, that unpasteurized dairy products were a big driver of that problem because of, of milk and raw cheese in, in, in Baja, California. 
And it's like, well, that's exciting because so much of the efforts we're not looking at uh, 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 Mycobacterium bovis and, and how that contributes. Um, and then when I went back after five years to CDC, I had uh, that excitement of, of trying to develop programs and implement them and evaluate them to improve uh, uh, public health uh, uh, issues and focused a lot on antibiotic resistance and overuse of antibiotics. Um, and then when I jumped to my third career uh, at ABC News, it was an idea of can you practice public health in front of a camera? If so many of the issues that we are dealing with have to do with the choices people make and how they understand the drivers of health, can you use media as a way to help people make better decisions? And during a crisis, can you use media as a way of helping people understand uh, what risks are and what they aren't and, and things that they can do to, to, uh, to protect their health? So uh, I'm now on, on to my, my fourth career uh, at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And that's really what I want to focus, focus uh, my, my talk on. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do uh, as a philanthropy to improve health, health in America. And a lot of it has to do with the title on this slide. And it's, it's about changing how America uh, th thinks, about, thinks about health. One of the things that uh, I've learned uh, as I near the end of my first year uh, at the foundation is that philanthropy really has a very special place in our country. There, there are very few countries that, that have philanthropy to, in the way that, that we do here. And, and we, have, uh, we have the opportunity and responsibility that, that other sectors of society don't, don't have. We're able to stick with a problem for a very long time. Uh, we're able to invest in something where uh, it may not be clear what the solution is uh, and stick with it and, and support those who are working to, to, to find the solutions. Um, we don't solve the problems. We support those who, who are out there, there doing that work. Um, and, and that's a lot of you here in, in, in the room. So uh, what we're all about right now is getting people to think about health, health differently. And uh, I want to explain why that, that's so important. For many of you in the room, this is all old hat. So this, is, this slide here looks at life expectancy uh, ar around the globe. In, in the United States, life expectancy is, is 78.8 years. But looking at some of, of the comparator countries, Japan, it's 83.9 years. France, it's 82.4 years. The UK, 81 years. Um, yet we spend far more money than any of them on healthcare. We spend, we spend $3 trillion on healthcare, and that's, and that's twice, more than twice as much as the next uh, highest, highest country. Um, looking at it as a percentage of GDP, we spend 17.1% of our gross domestic product on healthcare. Uh, the next highest, France, is at 11.6%. But if you think about, about what drives health, it's not just about treatment. It's not just about healthcare. You have to look at the, at the social sectors as, as well. And if you look at those data, um, this looks at health and social spending as a percentage of GDP. You'll see that the US is right in the middle there if you add in the social spending. What differentiates us from the rest of the countries is the overwhelming amount of money that we put in to, to health care rather than, rather than social care. Uh, and and this, is, this is a, a, a major issue. Heart disease, cancer, uh, stroke, diseases where we know prevention strategies, those prevention strategies are inadequately being, being applied. Um, and, and while this resonates with me as a social justice issue, an issue that, uh, that, that should stand on its own for those regards, it's, it also is a national security issue. 71% of 17 to 24 year olds um, would not qualify for military service because either they didn't finish high school, they have had a run in with the, the legal system, or the biggest factor is that they're overweight or obese. And so whether this issue of health and health status in, the, in this country resonates because uh, people should have a right to health, um, or because as a nation, uh, it's, it puts us at great risk if people aren't healthy, um, it gets us to the same place. Uh, you know, 
when we think about the issues of health it, it, and, and what those drivers are, um, I'm constantly brought back to my experience as a general pediatrician. So throughout my career, while I've been practicing public health, I've also been practicing general pediatrics. And it's always been in a setting uh, with a population that is, is the population I'm most passionate about trying to, to affect change in. And so in San Diego, uh, I worked with our residents and, and each month we went to a, a clinic in Tijuana that was built on the side of a, of, of a major trash dump. Uh, the idea that the parents there had any less desire for their children to be healthy than the parents we were seeing in San Diego is, is absolutely absurd. The same desires were there, but the opportunity for those children to grow up healthy it just, it just wasn't there. In, in uh, Atlanta at CDC, I worked in a clinic that dealt uh, with a population that was largely Latino immigrant. Uh, a high percentage uh, were not documented. They had no access to, to health insurance, to social services. Uh, and again, I, I saw uh, those parents having the same wants and desires for their children as, uh, as I do for, for mine. And then in New York, uh, I worked for seven years as a volunteer at a clinic in Harlem, and 80% of our patients were in the foster care system. And they were in the foster care system for a wide variety of reasons. Um, many of them, though, because their parents uh, may have had an issue with addiction and drug use and had been incarcerated and had lost custody of their children uh, because of that. But I remember seeing a grandmother in, in New York in the clinic who was a, who was a foster parent for her her grandchildren, and she had traveled to Harlem from, uh, from uh, I think from Staten Island, uh, because we were the clinic that had the contract. And uh, you know, I talked about the importance of good nutrition and eating right and physical activity, and that their children should get an hour of physical activity after school. And she was taking her children from Staten Island by subway out to Brooklyn to be able to participate in a in a, a program that gave them physical activity because she couldn't afford one near, near her house and there weren't other options. And so the, the idea that the wants and desires of, of, of people for health are different, I, I think is, is, is misconstrued. And we talk about health, uh, such a big part of health being uh, the choices that we make. Uh, but one of the things that we like to talk about is that the choices you make depend on the choices that you have. And for so many people in America, they don't have those healthy choices to make. We don't make health, healthy the, the, the easy option. So let's look at, at, at some local data here. Uh, many of you have seen this. I don't expect you to be able to read any of it. At a, at a high level, um, look at the colors. This is, this is a, um, a, a graphic looking at life expectancy uh, at birth in years for Baltimore City between 2011 and 2015. So green indicates High life expectancy, red indicates that it's, that it's uh, much lower. So looking at some of the neighbors, uh, neighborhoods around, around Hopkins, in Fells Point and Canton, people can expect to live up to 87 years of life, uh, years of age. Two miles away in Old Town, life expectancy drops to, to 72. Five miles west in Upton, uh, Druid Heights, it drops all the way down to 67. That's a 20 year difference in life expectancy over a, about a 14 minute car drive. So, you know, why is that? You know, here in Baltimore, we have one of the best hospitals in, in, in the world. We have a world-class university. Uh, we're generate, you're generating here uh, knowledge that is, is used around the world uh, to, to improve health. But when you look at what the drivers are, uh, the primary drivers of health, there are things like jobs and schools, uh, their housing, their exposure to violence, their, uh, their, the, the barriers from discrimination uh, and lack of opportunity. And at Hopkins, there, there's a recognition of this. There's engagement here in Baltimore, in the East Baltimore Development Initiative. Um, I, was, I was talking with the dean earlier about efforts to try and address uh, opioid use here in the area around, uh, uh, around Hopkins. Um, and that's, that's critically important. Uh, one of the things that we really are, are looking to is to say how can we help uh, yeah. major institutions, major health institutions become anchor institutions in their community to, to, to drive health. Four years ago at the foundation, uh, we, we undertook uh, strategic thinking and, and new direction. 
and set as our vision what we call a culture of health. And by a culture of health, we mean creating a society in which health is the easy option. It's a recognition that, that health is really driven by, by where we live and work. Uh, it's driven by where our kids go to school uh, and where they, where they play. And it's a recognition that everyone in America should have a fair and just opportunity for health and that that is not the case right now. And it's a big vision that recognizes that if we're going to make big inroads in, in health in this country, it's not going to be done just by the health sector. It's not going to be done without participation by all of the sectors that, that combine for society. And so you know, we, we at the foundation are, are looking to define, well, what pieces of this belong to us? What pieces of this uh, are, are being undertaken by, by, by others? Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it was so uh, uh, inspiring for us to see Hopkins launch the Bloomberg American Health Initiative because it's, it's a real recognition of the role social determinants of health play in, in the health of, of, of people throughout this country. And I know that Josh Sharfstein and Michelle Spencer understand the importance of this. I, I met recently, we had uh, the Surgeon General Jerome uh, Adams come spend the day with us at the, at the foundation. And uh, it was fun for me because I got, to, I got to put my journalist hat back on and uh, interview him in a fireside chat uh, in front of uh, our, our staff, and our staff participated in questioning. And it was clear to me that, that he gets it. He really understands this. One of the reports that he wants to work on is, is the connection between health and the economy, and how econ uh, ec the economy is a, is, is a driver of health. Um, as we look at, at the issue of of, of, of a culture of health and how we create the conditions that allow everyone to be, to be healthy. One of the things that is, is, is front and center is the issue of, of health equity. And uh, this is a, a challenging topic to, to talk about, so I wanna spend a little, little time on it. Um, when we think about equity, we think about uh, equity being uh, everyone having a fair and just opportunity for health. Uh, that the barriers that are in place due to race and gender, physical ability, uh, entrenched poverty, and, and, and other factors uh, have been removed. And, and we view equity as being, being uh, grounded in a fundamentally American concept of opportunity. Uh, when you look back at, 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 at uh, founding documents, uh, uh, although we don't live up to them as we should. The idea that all are created equal, it's all men, but all uh, created equal. Uh, the idea that our children in school pledge allegiance to a flag with liberty and justice for all. That idea of justice is, is, is hard baked in as an American concept. Uh, and we, we pride ourselves that people should be allowed to pursue happiness. If you accept that those are, are truly American values, then, then it underlies this idea of equity as making it possible for everyone to, to, uh, to achieve those, 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 those goals. Um, and we know that we're nowhere near that, but we wanna make sure that all of the work we do at the foundation is grounded in that concept of equity, that we're looking at all of our work to make sure that we are doing what, I, what we can to improve, uh, improve opportunity. When it comes to, to talking about equity, uh, there, there are challenges around that. And so we've done some research and some work and uh, I, I wanna share with you uh, where, we've, where we've come with our, our graphic to explain equity. So uh, I'll explain this. The top is equality, the bottom is equity. So the goal here is for people to be able to ride a bicycle. And the top one, you, uh, uh, everyone is given a nice one size fits all bicycle. And you can see the person on the left has physical limitations, is not gonna be able to use that bicycle. The person uh, uh, next to her is about my height and is gonna get a really bad backache uh, using that bicycle. Uh, the, the woman uh, uh, next over is doing pretty well and the little kid, no, is not gonna be able to push those pedals. Um, that's an idea of equality, everyone getting the same thing. Equity is everyone getting what they need to be able to ride a bike. 
And so it's not one size fits all. This is giving everyone the opportunity for that physical, physical activity. Uh, so we're trying that out as another way of, of, of talking about equity uh, and that idea of, of, of what, true opportunity, uh, what, what true opportunity is. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to, to drive a culture of health and, and how we're trying to focus our efforts. Because as I said, uh, we recognize that a culture of health is way beyond what we as a foundation and what the health sector uh, can do. There are things that we are focusing in on doing. There are things that we are, are, are celebrating that others are taking on. And there are things that we are trying to catalyze other sectors to, uh, to take on as their, as, as, as their approach. Um, through all of our work, uh, as, as, as the dean said, we're the largest foundation in the US focused on health. Uh, we have about $11 billion. We, we fund about $500 million a year, which is a lot of money. Um, but if it's spread too thin or if it's not used effectively, uh, you can spend $500 million, million a year and, and not have much to show, show for it. We're, we're focused on shifting mindsets and getting people to think about health in a different way. We're trying to help create the conditions in communities that allow people to live as healthy a life as possible. Uh, we are big on data and evidence, which is why we fund uh, as much research as, uh, as we do, uh, because we believe that, that it's important to have evidence to inform the, the, the changes in programs that we're supporting. And we have a big belief in, in the importance of leadership, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The three areas that we focus on uh, programmatically, uh, creating healthy communities, and by that we're looking to create communities where health is the easy option. Uh, we're looking at the role housing plays uh, in health. Uh, if you don't have a house, forget about the rest of it. It's, it's not gonna happen. If someone doesn't have stable housing uh, that's affordable, that's, that's safe, um, asking them to eat right and exercise isn't gonna go very far. Um, healthy children and families. Uh, we have, we have a, a bold goal of all children um, having, having high quality, uh, uh, well, uh, all children having social, emotional, and physical health, and what they need to be successful when they start school. Uh, we're interested in policies that help support families to, to get that done. Um, and and we're, we're interested uh, in, in looking at the role early, early childhood and early childhood education can play. And then coordinating health and healthcare systems. This is that idea that, that the healthcare system needs to be more uh, about more than just providing treatment for someone's illness. It needs to connect to a patient's overall social needs. And I'll, I'll give an example of uh, a program. You all have been very involved there. So um, three examples of the, whoops. So don't click that until you're ready to show the video. OK. <laughs> I wasn't ready to show the video. So uh, in terms of our healthy community work, one of the areas that we, we believe in very strongly is the importance of data. And we have a program called uh, the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And each year we put out data that allows uh, uh, people in their communities to see how they're faring compared to other counties, other communities in, the, in their state. Uh, and then it allows them to look at what some of the factors are that, that go behind those, those health metrics. Uh, what's the rate of high school graduation and teen pregnancy and obesity? Um, those factors allow communities to say, okay, here's a problem we're seeing. Uh, and the roadmaps give them ideas and ways forward for here's how we might be able to address it. Um, this has been, been terrific. It's been very well received. And we're seeing it catalyze action around the country that we're not funding. We're providing the data, and this is through the Univers University of Wisconsin uh, Population Institute. Uh, the, the latest county health rankings came out a week or two ago. And the, the report focused not just on the county rankings, but it broke things down for the first time by race. And so it highlighted that, that there were differences based on place, but even within that, within each place, we saw major disparities based on race. And we're hoping that this will help drive conversations uh, and, and program areas. One of the ways we, we, we help and hope to drive change is by elevating communities that are taking this on and are addressing these determinants and seeing improvements in, the, in, in their health. And uh, um, it's terrific. Last, last uh, fall, I, I got to go out to a small town in central Kansas to announce that they were a winner of a Culture of Health Prize. 
and uh, it was Allen County. And uh, I, was, uh, I was in the town square, and there was a, uh, a fifth grade drum band uh, was sitting there drumming away. They didn't know why they were there. They were just told to come. And I guess in, in rural America, if they say, come to the town square, everyone shows up. In the town. <laughs> it, it, I felt like I was in our town or something. And, and, uh, and they unfurled the banner that they were the winners of the Culture of the Health Prize, and their, se their US senator was there, and the band kicked in. And it was this, this, this big deal for this community. And it was a big deal. And so I, I want to show um, just a short video that, um, that highlights what, what they did and what we are trying to drive uh, ac across America. Allen County is a rural community in southeastern Kansas. For decades, it has been slowly losing population, a trend that taxed the physical and economic health of the community. But Allen County is breaking the cycle with a combination of pride, planning and partnerships. We aren't rich, we're scrappy. Our best asset is our people. People judge you by your character rather than what you have or what you don't have. I am always looking for ways to get things done around here. Some way might not work, we try a different way. Allen County has 13,000 people spread across 505 square miles. We've had to be intentional about creating opportunities for community conversations. Get people together and get them expressing what we need, what we want, how we could be serving each other better. You have to communicate. You have to make people believe in themselves. Thrive is a convener. It's an organization that can take ideas and make them real. We, we don't do the work, the people do the work. We look at data, we test, we learn. We've made it over a huge hurdle as a community from the, the weather to the how. MARB stands for Mills and Reading Vehicle. The kids know we're coming and yes, we honk <laughs> as we're driving up so they know that we're here. Part of getting healthy adults is you have to get healthy children. I truly am a believer that we are going to cut down on obesity, um, diabetes, heart disease, but it has to start with feeding kids healthy meals because that's where health starts. We do everything from aluminum cans to combines. If it's metal, we'll buy it. I looked around the area and decided that we needed some workers in, around here. You know, people that knew how to do things with their hands. So he put his money where his mouth is by buying a former lumberyard complex and donating buildings on that complex so that it could become the Regional Rural Technology Center. Keep the jobs here, keep them here. That's what we're hoping to do. Train kids and try to keep them home. 10 years ago, we started by saying, let's build trails and let's work on sidewalks and connectivity. We were overrun with people using them. There's been a concerted effort over the last several years to bring a retail bike shop to Allen County. It's been a huge success. So this has to move in order to keep the chain tight, otherwise the chain will fall off. So we're talking about health, we're talking about physical activity, we're talking about economic development, and we're talking about new opportunities to socialize. You weave these elements together and then you've got a culture of health. It was, it was uh, for me, just quite an experience uh, to, to see this community that had fairly entrenched poverty. Uh, they, they had no health system. They had no grocery store. They voted to, to add a sales tax, which funded the construction of a new hospital. Uh, and they rapidly pursued a grocery, grocery chain to have them bring a, a store to town. I, I was talking to the vice president of, of, the, of the grocery store. I said, why did you come here? He said, because they wanted us. And it was just this can-do spirit that was that was uh, that was really exciting. Um, the next project I want to I want to talk about is uh, is work in our healthy children area. 
And uh, a lot of work has been done looking at, at uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences. A lot of work done, uh, done here. Uh, Christy Bethel here is, is a big researcher in, in that area. But it's, it's clear, uh, there's just growing evidence that, that the experiences children have at a very young age can have a profound impact on, on, on their future health and, and, and prospects. Um, adverse childhood experiences, things like physical abuse and neglect, uh, experiencing natural disasters, witnessing violent acts, uh, these all factor in. Um, and there's, there's, there's also a lot of effort underway to try and say, okay, let's not take this as, uh, as a done deal. Uh, there are one in five children have, have been exposed to two or more of these adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and we want to make sure that they have the tools they, they need to succeed. And so we worked with, with Sesame Street uh, to develop a program called Sesame Street in, in Communities, which gives parents, uh, practitioners, schools, tools to use to deal with children who have suffered uh, in enormous amounts of, of, of trauma. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one more short, uh, shorter video that, uh, that is just one of the tools that Sesame Street uh, has developed to help families deal with uh, um, and help a child who has a parent who's uh, in jail. Hey, Alex, maybe we can get our dads to make cars like that with us, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah, and then we can race cars together. That's a great idea. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, come, oh, come, on. come on, it would be fun. Yeah, yeah, just ask your daddy. Well, he yeah. can't do it. He's, he's not around right now. Huh? Well, where is he? Uh, somewhere else. Oh, did he go on vacation? Is he visiting somewhere? Yeah, where'd he go? Yeah, where? I, look, I don't want to talk about it. Okay? <laughs> okay, yeah. Did, did we say something wrong? I don't know. He's upset about something. Come on. Okay, Alex! 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 Listen, Alex, whatever it is that's on your mind, you don't have to tell us. But we're your friends, and you can always talk to us if you want. It's just, all this talk about my dad and where he is got me really upset. Oh, because your daddy's away? Uh, and you miss him? Yeah, but because of where he is, too. My dad is, my dad's in jail. In jail? Why? I don't like to talk about it. Most people don't understand. Actually, I do understand what you're going through. When I was about your age, my dad was incarcerated too. He was? Wait, um, what's carcerated? And why was your dad in it? Incarcerated is when someone breaks the law, a grown-up rule, and then they have to go to jail or prison. So th these tools are being rolled out uh, around the country. There are three communities where, where uh, we're piloting them or we're supporting a pilot uh, to see uh, what impact can they have. How do you use these, these best to uh, affect outcomes for, for, for children? Uh, but uh, uh, Tara Oakman, who's here with me, is the, the program officer who, who moved forward this concept. And it's, it's one of the ways of trying to address uh, the, the health of children at a, at a very young, young age. Um, uh, the last uh, example that I want to touch on is, is one that's very close to the, the Hopkins world, and this is Health Leads. Um, Health Leads is a program that, that looks to tie clinical care to patients' overall social needs. So you see a patient in your clinic um, who has an issue, they don't have stable housing, they don't have electricity, they don't have access to, fr to fresh, uh, fresh food. Um, you can write a prescription for them for fresh food. They take it out to the health leads desk. Uh, originally, these were staffed with student volunteers who know what resources are in a community, and they connect 
the family to those resources. Um, it's an incredible model that has been uh, uh, now uh, uh, implemented in, in thousands of clinics around the country, and we're working with health leads to try and uh, bring it to even even bigger scale. But I know that uh, Josh Sharstein and others were were uh, very uh, uh, influential in, in getting this adopted uh, in many places, including the Harriet Lane Clinic across the street and over at, at, at Bayview uh, Medical Center. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, um, you know, as a philanthropy, we, we make grants, and we make them to, to groups and, and organizations that we think can do. And Hopkins is one of those places that we, we think uh, can do. And, and I'm really proud of the connection we've had uh, over the years. I'm very proud of the work that's going on at the uh, American uh, Health Initiative. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch on, though, and there's, there's a strong Hopkins connection there as well, is, is our leadership programs. And we have four new leadership programs. I know there are a number of people uh, here at the, at the school who are participating in these. But since our founding, we've, we've believed that, that training leaders is one of the most important things we do. If we want to change things in society, uh, if you bet on people, uh, you invest in them and you give them skills, uh, they can identify the problems in their communities, they can identify those solutions, uh, and, they can, and they can make change. And uh, two years ago, we, re we revamped our leadership programs. Uh, for 40 years, we had run the premier program on health services research, the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. Uh, and people who've come through that program represent leaders around the nation in health services research. Um, but the feeling was, if we want to change things at the community level, we need different types of leaders. And so we have four new leadership programs. Um, they've just closed in terms of their, their applications for this year. Uh, and, but I would encourage people to think about it for, for the future. The, the Culture of Health Leaders is a program that recognizes that we need all kinds of different disciplines engaged in this. And so we have people uh, in that program from, from transportation and the built environment and from uh, architecture and from, uh, uh, from theology, from the, uh, the faith sector, who are learning how to affect change in their community. Clinical Scholars is, is, is a program that takes teams of, of, of clinicians from communities who identify a problem and learn to work together to solve that problem. The Interdisciplinary Research Leaders pairs uh, people from academia, people who are trained in doing research with people in the community who are working on a problem. So that together they're learning how to do community-based participatory research. And then the health policy research scholars uh, is, is a way of, 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 of addressing the issue that the people around the policy table uh, are not a good representation of the people across America. And this, this program takes underrepresented populations uh, who are in doctoral programs, and it can be from a wide range of fields, and gives them training in how to be effective in, in, in health policy. Um, and I truly believe that, that the leaders who are coming out of these programs, the leaders who are coming out of your Bloomberg Fellows programs, the leaders who are being trained in a, in a different way of thinking about health are truly going to affect change in, in, in this country. Uh, I, I want to end there so that we've got uh, a few minutes for, for questions. Um, but I really, uh, I, I've, I've been here uh, for, uh, since 7 this morning when we started with meetings. Uh, and I'm, I'm really uh, so excited about the work that's, that's going on here at the school. Uh, I, I can't wait to hear some of your questions and ideas uh, because I think that, that we are moving towards a different way of thinking about health uh, that is likely to, to have profound impact uh, on the lives of, of our entire population. Thank you very much. So I think, I think we've got about 10 minutes for, for questions. I love questions on anything. Thanks so much for a wonderful talk and for coming to spend the day with us here at Hopkins. My name's Jonathan Crow. I'm a master's in public health student here at Hopkins. I'm also a medical student, and I'm from the Atlanta, Georgia area. So I just want to say go Braves. Go Braves. Uh, <laughs> both big Braves baseball fans. 
Uh, I, I really love uh, your comment on the role that philanthropy plays in sort of a uniquely American uh, uh, approach to health. And I thought your, your point you raised about uh, Allen, Kansas, about how they really started with identifying what the community's desires were for health and really tailoring an approach to what the community already wanted really is a, an interesting approach. And I was just wondering if you could offer some thoughts on how we in academia, in the health sector, uh, and in philanthropy can go about better identifying the health needs and the health desires that Americans already have and really tailoring some of our approaches to that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think at one level um, we have to be more opportunistic and recognize that there are, there are groups that are attacking these problems from different angles who don't view them as health interventions at all that are profoundly affecting health. So Allen County, they started their work as economic development. They wanted to make Allen County an attractive place for businesses to come and invest. And they recognized that you're not gonna get anyone to come in if you don't have a supermarket. You're not gonna get them to come in if there aren't places for kids to play. You're not gonna get them to come in if there isn't a hospital. And so they started working from, from that angle. And, and I see that in, in quite a number of places that it's, it's the, the economic engine that's driving people's interest. And that's terrific. Um, we have to lighten up you know, in terms of, well, what you're doing is a health intervention. And it's like, if they don't see it that way, that's, that's fine. We can work towards, uh, towards people understanding the role that the economy, a livable wage, all of these things factor in, in together. I visited a, a, an incredible uh, uh, development in Atlanta at East Lake, um, and this was a this again was an attempt. Uh, it was an economic uh, uh, engine that was driving it. But uh, in Atlanta, uh, public housing housing project with the highest homicide rate, one of the highest crime rates. The school had I think a 13 percent graduation rate. Um, it was uh, called Little Vietnam. As, as a reflection at the time of, of it was a war zone. The city decided to take that on and transform public housing, transform the life of the people in that neighborhood. And they built beautiful mixed income uh, housing. Half of it is public housing and half is, is uh, market rate housing. They built a new high school uh, that has a Y attached to it. Um, it's become, uh, the highest graduation rate high school in Atlanta. Uh, the, the, uh, the community is extremely desirable. The land around it is, is the property values are going up, so they're looking to see how do you protect that so that the, the residents can come in. But for 10 years, the person who ran it, for 10 years she fought uh, any, any connection of this to health. And it wasn't until then they started looking at the health data and recognizing that their rates of obesity were down and hypertension and diabetes were lower than the rest. They'd say, well, yeah, I guess this is a health intervention. So uh, uh, I hope that answered your question. Hi. Dr. Bresser, um, I have a question about uh, public confidence in health messages and public confidence in um, public health authorities. Uh, given all of the availability that people have to information, much of which is misinformation. I wonder if you can just reflect a little bit on where you see the trajectory in our contemporary society with respect to those public confidence messages. Yeah. Uh, it's a real challenge. You know, it's something that, that um, I saw at ABC News. Uh, there, uh, one, of my, one of their goals for me was to be a trusted voice for health. Uh, in America, to be America's doctor, a place people could turn for trusted information. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but it's it's a real it's a real challenge, and uh, you know it's something I was I was talking to someone about yesterday. I don't know whether distrust of experts and science uh, is higher than it was, or whether there are just more platforms for amplifying uh, fringe fringe perspectives. Uh, I hope it's the more platform issue and, 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 and not the, the former. But um, I think it's something we all need to look at really, really critically. Um, how do we talk about what we do? Do we use language that is readily understandable? Or do we use words like social determinants of health that only those in the field understand? Um, are, we, are we reaching people where they are? 
uh, where they like to get information in, in language that, that resonates or we not. I think, I think the, the health and medical field uh, is pretty bad at it. Uh, you know, when you look at just just in clinical encounters, uh, the the amount of jargon that that, that takes place. Um, but I see it all the time when I'm listening to the news, and I'll hear a sound bite. It's like, no, you don't want to use that word. Um, it's it's important, I think, that anyone coming through public health training gets some real training on the use of words and language and, and communication, and doesn't see that as a sidelight to what they do. Sees it as a central role. Of, of the work of a public health uh, professional. Uh, Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I really admire the work of your foundation. Um, my question is about uh, the really interesting statistic in your uh, presentation that 71% of 17 to 24 year olds uh, would not qualify for the military. Yeah. Um, in, in World War II, there was a major draft rejection crisis where 50% and in some places 75% of the recruits did not, or the draftees did not qualify for the military during World War II. And my question is, at, at that point, that was a crystallizing issue that cut across political, racial, regional lines that uh, helped create uh, the modern public health service, um, extended public health departments across the country. I mean, people really grabbed onto that issue. Do you see a, a similar issue or set of issues that might have the same effect for us in the 21st century? Well, I, I, I think that's a great question. I think that that statistic is something that could be used, and mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to do that. We're, we partner with a group called Council for a, a, a Stronger, Strong America. Yeah, you know, Council for a Strong America, and uh, one of the groups within that are are former generals, colonels, admirals, um, and they go to Capitol Hill to advocate for programs for healthy children, um, for healthy food in schools, for uh, mandatory physical activity, for family leave, for you know all of these things, and and. Uh, they resonate in a different way on Capitol Hill than someone who is coming from a traditional public health background. But I think if you really, if you really want to unpack that figure, it's not just the obesity uh, and overweight. It's the interaction with the criminal justice system. And so it quickly takes you to the issue of, 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 of true justice and what's happening in a criminal justice system uh, and equity issues there. So you know, you need to, there's a lot in that number that, that you can dive into and, and, and address. Um, and for some people, that number will, will motivate change. And we'll, you know, we're, non we're, we're nonpartisan. Um, I see a very important role for us as a, a leading health philanthropy to try and create a conversation uh, where we can bring people together with evidence uh, that is not immediately shot down because it came from the left or the right. Um, but with, with facts, uh, to look for some common ground. Because I think there's more common ground uh, than, than is surfacing, uh, because no one is trusted to surface solutions uh, without being seen as, as, as partisan. Uh, in the back, Senator. One second, please. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, my name is uh, Darrell, and I'm a research associate in the Department of Epidemiology. And um, as you were talking about the culture of health, I'm interested in if you could expound a little bit about how the culture of health might sort of intersect with uh, this notion of social justice specifically, and how do we account for intersections around race, gender, and sexuality, and how the culture of health might be able to both be broad enough to sort of um, capture some of the more important things, but also keep the nuance and around sort of issues that we know are sort of persistent issues around systematic racism or yeah. uh, homophobia or transphobia and so on. Yeah. Um, I, I think that those concepts come into how we define uh, health equity and removal of, of barriers related to discrimination. Um, it, it definitely ties into institutional um, uh, uh, structures that, that, that discriminate. Um, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very wary to use the term social justice. 
uh, and they're not because I have any problem with the concept of social justice, but it's a it's a it's a push button issue uh, for many uh, on the, uh, on the right, many conservatives, and I think you can get there to, uh, by defining the concepts and what uh, what we're talking about without the word. Um, I'm very. I think because of my time in media, I'm very focused on the power of words to either bring people together or to, or to split. Um, and words to declare what team you're on. And social justice immediately declares, you know, team blue. And, and that's okay if your goal is to talk to a blue audience. But, you know, I really want to think, you know, how does what we're trying to do, how would I sell this on Fox and Friends? You know, and if we, in the room, people who are working on, on public health can't make, it, make what we're trying to do resonate with, with conservative audience and respect the perspective of people who come from, from uh, a conservative base, we're not going to get very far. But I think that we can do it. And, and so you know, uh, we fund a project with the uh, uh, MIT Media Lab where they, they do word analysis, word cloud analysis, and how words are used by different uh, uh, groups across the political spectrum, how they resonate, what things are retweeted by different populations. And you know, what we're looking to see is, OK, is there a course that you can, you can plot that won't uh, alienate uh, one side or the other? Uh, is there that common ground? And that's why I like to talk about equity framed as an American value. Um, and and I think that there is some room there around framing it as an American value that can pull people together. How, how are we on time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one or two more, if there are. I see some over here. Hello, I'm Ned Bartlett. I'm a pediatrician. I do know you. Um, uh, from the past. Uh, I was wondering about, in addition to um, Allen, Kansas, or anywhere else, having uh, food, education, jobs, uh, those kinds of things, uh, whether an education piece of financial literacy uh, for the individuals involved in poverty uh, would be an important piece. Uh, I, the question had to do with financial literacy. I don't know if any of our uh, work has looked at financial literacy and, and, and the role uh, it plays. Clearly, financial literacy is a, a, important and would be an important factor to, to look at. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. One more? I don't know. Great. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering your response to recent articles that have put more of the emphasis of U.S. healthcare spending on the prices of pharmaceutical spend as opposed to social spending and how that fits in um, with your vision going forward. Yeah, yeah. so the recent data that was looking at the reason we spend so much more on health care isn't because we're ordering more tests and doing more things, it's that everything costs more. Um, that's a problem. Uh, yeah, you know, in terms of, of our work, uh, we have uh, been big proponents of, of access to care. Uh, and everyone having access to care. Um, we have also supported a lot of work around, around quality um, and looking at uh, what tests are ordered and choosing wisely in some of the efforts in the clinical side to make sure that the tests we're doing are, uh, are, are beneficial to, to, to patients. Um, uh, but there is a major disparity in terms of what we pay for medications in this country versus uh, versus other other countries, and if we're truly serious about reining in costs, that's one of those things that's going to need to be need to be addressed. Uh, but we don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of active programming around uh, reducing cost in clinical care. Um, our focus is much more now on um, uh, on looking upstream at at what can we do to reduce you know, the need for clinical care and making sure that, that people have access to clinical care when they, when they truly need it. Um, with that, I'll end the questions, and I, I thank you very much. It's great to be here.